Hello and welcome to Spec Transfer. Today we'll be looking at 3.2.1 cell structure from the AQA A level biology specification. So, starting off with the structure of eukaryotic cells, this is basically just learning some details about the structure and function of a number of different organelles, as well as a small part on cell specialization. So a quick overview of cells. Organisms can be eukaryotes or prokaryotes. Prokaryotic organisms are prokaryotic cells, i.e. they're single celled, and eukaryotic organisms are made up of eukaryotic cells. So let's have a look at some diagrams of animal and plant cells. You can distinguish between Golgi apparatus and rough endoplasmic reticulum by seeing that the rough endoplasmic reticulum has ribosomes on its surface and it's consistent with the nuclear envelope, whereas the Golgi apparatus has round vesicles at the end. So just comparing plant cells with animal cells, they have the same organelles as animal cells, just that they also have a cellulose cell wall with plasmodesmata, which are channels that allow the exchange of substances with other cells, a permanent vacuole, and finally chloroplasts. So let's have a look at algal and fungal cells. Algal cells are a lot like plant cells. They have the same organelles, as well as a cellulose cell wall and chloroplasts. They can therefore photosynthesize like plants, but they can be unicellular or multicellular. Fungal cells are also a lot like plant cells, but with two key differences. First, the cell wall is made of chitin, and second, they don't have chloroplasts, so they cannot photosynthesize. So let's have a look at the organelles we need to know, starting with the cell surface membrane, which is the membrane that is found at the surface of animal cells and just inside the wall of other cells. It is made mainly of lipids and proteins and also carbohydrates, which are attached to either the lipids or proteins. It regulates the movement of substances into and out of the cell and also has receptor molecules on it, which allow it to respond to chemicals such as hormones. Next we have the nucleus, which is a large organelle that is surrounded by a nuclear envelope, a double membrane, which contains many pores. The nucleus contains chromosomes made from protein-bound linear DNA and one or more structures called a nucleolus. The nucleus controls the cell's activities by controlling the transcription of DNA. DNA contains instructions to make proteins. The pores, which are called nuclear pores, allow substances such as RNA to move between the nucleus and the cytoplasm. The nucleolus makes ribosomes. Next we have mitochondria, which are usually oval shaped. They have a double membrane, of which the inner is folded to form Christi. Inside is a matrix, which contains enzymes involved in aerobic respiration. Mitochondria are the sites of aerobic respiration, where ATP is synthesized. They're found in large numbers in cells that are very active and require lots of energy such as muscle cells, for example. Then we have chloroplasts. Chloroplasts are small, flattened structures found in plant and algal cells. They are surrounded by a double membrane and also have membranes inside called thylakoid membranes. These membranes are stacked up in some parts of the chloroplast to form grana. Grana are linked by lamellae, which are thin, flattened pieces of thylakoid membrane. Chloroplasts are the site where photosynthesis takes place. Some parts of photosynthesis happen in the grana and others happen in the stroma, which is a thick fluid found in chloroplasts. Next we have everybody's favourite, the Golgi apparatus. The Golgi apparatus is a group of fluid-filled, membrane-bound, flattened sacs. Vesicles are often seen at the edges of the sacs. The Golgi apparatus processes and packages new lipids and proteins, and also makes lysosomes. Then we have Golgi vesicles. A Golgi vesicle is a small, fluid-filled sac in the cytoplasm, surrounded by a membrane, and is produced by the Golgi apparatus. Golgi vesicles store lipids and proteins produced by the Golgi apparatus and transport them out of the cell via the cell surface membrane. This is known as exocytosis. Next we have lysosomes. A lysosome is a round organelle surrounded by a membrane with no clear internal structure. It's a type of Golgi vesicle. 
Lysosomes contain hydrolytic enzymes such as lysozymes, which are kept separate from the cytoplasm by the surrounding membrane and can be used to hydrolyze invading cells or worn out components of the cell. Then we have ribosomes, which are very small organelles that either float free in the cytoplasm or are found attached to the rough endoplasmic reticulum. They are made of proteins and RNA and are not surrounded by a membrane. They are the site where proteins are made. This is called protein synthesis. Then we have the rough endoplasmic reticulum, which is a system of membranes enclosing a fluid filled space. The surface is covered with ribosomes. The rough endoplasmic reticulum processes and packages proteins made at the ribosomes. Note that the rough endoplasmic reticulum is attached to the nuclear envelope. Then we have the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, which has a similar structure to the rough endoplasmic reticulum, but no ribosomes. The smooth endoplasmic reticulum synthesizes and processes lipids. Next we have the cell wall, which is a rigid structure that surrounds cells in plants, algae and fungi. Note that in plants and algae, it's made of cellulose, whereas in fungi, it's made of chitin. The cell wall supports the cell and prevents it from changing shape. And finally, the cell vacuole, also known as the permanent vacuole. This is a membrane bound organelle found in the cytoplasm of plant cells. It contains the cell sap, which is a weak solution of sugar and salts. The surrounding membrane is called the tonoplast. The cell vacuole helps maintain the pressure inside the cell and keeps the cell rigid. This stops plants from wilting. The vacuole is also involved in the isolation of unwanted chemicals inside the cell. So now that we've looked at all of our main organelles found in eukaryotic cells, we just need to have a look at cell specialization. No cell can provide the best conditions for all functions. Therefore, cells of multicellular organisms are each specialized in different ways to perform a particular role. So here we have the zygote, which is the fertilized egg, which then undergoes mitosis to form embryonic stem cells, which are each unspecialized and identical. The embryonic stem cells then undergo differentiation to become all the different cells within an organism. All cells within an organism are produced by mitotic divisions from the fertilized egg. Therefore, they all contain the same genes. However, only some of the genes in a cell are expressed. Therefore, the shape may vary and the number of different organelles also varies. So let's have a look at some examples of specialized cells, starting with epithelial cells in the small intestine. Folds in their cell surface membranes, called microvilli, increase the surface area, increasing the rate of diffusion of products of digestion such as glucose and amino acids. They also contain lots of mitochondria to provide energy for active transport of these substances. Then we have sperm cells, which contain lots of mitochondria to provide energy to swim to the egg. The head also contains hydrolytic enzymes to break into the egg. It also has a long tail to swim to the egg. Note that a tissue is a group of specialized cells working together to perform a particular role. Tissues, for example, include muscle, nerve and xylem. A group of tissues working together to carry out a particular function is called an organ. For example, the heart, lungs, roots and leaves. A group of organs working together to carry out a particular function is known as an organ system. For example, the digestive, respiratory or reproductive systems. Nice, so now we've completed the structure of eukaryotic cells section of our specification. So let's move on to prokaryotic cells and viruses. Firstly, the structure of prokaryotic cells. The cytoplasm has no membrane bound organelles. The ribosomes are much smaller than in eukaryotic cells, only 70S ribosomes, whereas in eukaryotic cells we have 70S and 80S ribosomes, but more on that later. 
they also have a single circular DNA molecule that is free in the cytoplasm and not associated with proteins. The cell wall supports the cell and prevents it from changing shape. It is made of murin, which is a type of glycoprotein. The structures labelled in green are ones which are found in some prokaryotes but not in others. Many prokaryotic cells also have one or more plasmids, which are small loops of DNA and contain genes for things such as antibiotic resistance. They are used to transfer genetic material from one bacterium to another. Some bacteria also may have a slime capsule, which helps protect the bacteria from attack by other cells such as lymphocytes and helps bacteria group together for further protection. Bacteria may also have one or more flagelli, which are long hair-like structures that rotate. They facilitate movement. I think it would be good to just do a quick comparison of prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells, as this is a type of question that examiners like to include. So do they have a nucleus? Well, prokaryotic cells do not have a nucleus, only a circular DNA molecule. Eukaryotic cells do have a nucleus. Prokaryotic cells do not have protein-based DNA, whereas in eukaryotic cells, yes, the DNA is associated with proteins called histones. In prokaryotic cells, yes, we do have plasmids in some. They do not occur in eukaryotic cells. No, we don't have chloroplasts in prokaryotic cells, only bacterial chlorophyll in the cell surface membrane of some, and we only have chloroplasts in plants and algae within eukaryotic cells. In prokaryotic cells, we have smaller ribosomes, only 70S, whereas in eukaryotic cells, we could have 70S and 80S ribosomes. The 70S ribosomes are ribosomes found, for example, in mitochondria or chloroplasts of eukaryotic cells. Then we have prokaryotic cells that have a cell wall, which yes, they do, but it's made of murin. In eukaryotic cells, the cell wall is made up of cellulose, if we're talking about plant cells. And in algae as well, it's made of cellulose, whereas in fungi, it will be made of chitin. In prokaryotic cells, we do sometimes have a slime capsule, whereas in eukaryotic cells, we do not have a slime capsule. Nice, so now we've looked at the structures found in prokaryotic cells as well as some structures which may be found in some prokaryotes but not in others. So finally we just need to have a look at viruses. Viruses are acellular and non-living. They are much smaller than bacteria, they are only 20 to 300 nanometers in size. So let's have a look at the structure. We have genetic material which can be either DNA or RNA. The genetic material is contained in a protein coat called a capsid, and then we have attachment proteins, which allow the virus to identify and attach to complementary receptor proteins on a host cell. Viruses cannot replicate without being inside a host cell. So how do viruses replicate? First off, the virus binds to complementary receptor proteins on the surface of host cells. The virus then injects its DNA or RNA into the host cell. The host cell's enzymes and ribosomes are used to make new viruses, virions, which are released from the cell and go on to hijack other cells. The host cell is killed in the process. Note that viruses do not undergo cell division as they are non-living. Great, that would be the structure of prokaryotic cells and of viruses. Finally, we'll have a look at methods of studying cells. So let's compare light and electron microscopes. Light microscopes use a beam of light, whereas electron microscopes use a beam of electrons. Light microscopes have a lower magnification and resolving power with a maximum resolution of 0.2 micrometers and a maximum magnification of times 1,500. Therefore, we cannot see ribosomes, endoplasmic reticula or lysosomes. A benefit of light microscopes, however, is that they can be used for live specimens. Electron microscopes have a higher magnification and resolving power with a maximum magnification of times 1,500,000 and a maximum resolution of 0.0002 micrometers. 
If asked in an exam why electron microscopes have a better resolving power, say that electrons have a shorter wavelength than light. A negative of electron microscopes, however, is that they cannot be used for live specimens, as the specimen has to be contained in a vacuum, as otherwise air particles would absorb electrons and therefore interfere with our results. There are two types of electron microscopes, transmission and scanning electron microscopes. Scanning electron microscopes work by, sp by scanning a beam of electrons across the specimen. Electrons are knocked off the specimen and are then gathered in a cathode ray tube. They can be used on thick specimens, but can only show a specimen surface. They produce a 3D image and have a lower resolution than transmission electron microscopes. Transmission electron microscopes transmit electrons through the specimen. Denser parts of the specimen absorb more electrons and therefore appear darker on the image. Transmission electron microscopes can show you the internal structure of organelles. They have a higher resolution than scanning electron microscopes. They produce a 2D image, but can only be used for thin specimens. Next, we need to learn a formula and two definitions. So magnification equals the image size over the actual size. And then we need to learn resolution, which is the minimum distance that two objects can be apart for them to appear as separate objects. And finally, magnification, how many times the image is larger than the specimen. Finally, we need to look at cell fractionation, which is the process by which cells are broken up and the organelles they contained are separated out. The first step in cell fractionation is homogenization, which breaks up cells using a homogenizer or by vibrating them. The plasma membrane breaks and the organelles are released into the solution the cells were kept in. The solution must be firstly cold, which reduces enzyme activity, which may hydrolyze organelles. Second, it must be isotonic. The solution surrounding the cells must have the same water potential as the cells being broken down to prevent organelles from bursting or shrinking due to an osmotic effect. Finally, the solution must have a buffer which maintains the pH. A fluctuating pH could damage organelles or affect the functioning of enzymes which may hydrolyze organelles. The second step in cell fractionation is filtration, the process in which the resultant fluid from homogenization, known as the homogenate, is filtered to remove any unbroken cells or cell debris. Finally, we have ultracentrifugation, the process by which the different organelles in the filtered solution are separated out in a centrifuge. First of all, the mixture is poured into a test tube, which is put into a centrifuge. This is then spun at a low speed. The heaviest organelles, such as the nuclei, are forced to the bottom and collect in something known as the pellet. The suspension above the pellet is known as the supernatant, which is then drained off poured into another test tube and spun at a higher speed. This time, lighter organelles such as mitochondria are found in the pellet. The supernatant is then drained off again and the process is repeated. Each time the tube is spun at a faster speed, lighter and less dense organelles are forced to the bottom and are found in the pellet. The order in which organelles are found in the pellet can be found here. The further down you go, the lighter and less dense the organelles get. Great, so now we've completed the methods of studying cells section of the specification. Thank you for watching Spec Transfer. Next time we'll be looking at all cells arise from other cells. See you then.